absolutely delighted to have Claire Lopez with us tonight as the speaker. Uh, Claire has often been on the other side of this podium, so it's especially apt that she be on this side to give us this talk this evening. I know many of you know Claire and her distinguished background and her present occupation, which is as Vice President for Research and Analysis at the Center for Security Policy. Most particularly, here comes a latecomer, she is the co-author of the monograph recently published on Gulen and the Gulenist movement, Turkey's Islamic supremacist cult, and its contributions to the civilization jihad. This book is available outside. I'm sure Claire will be happy to sign them after her talk, as well as a number of other publications from the Center for Security Policy and other of your works, Claire, are available. So I'm gonna be very brief here in um, introducing Claire to leave her ample time while the staff upstairs settles down. <laughs> in addition to her work at the Council for Security Policy, uh, Claire is a senior fellow at the London Center for Policy Research and a member of the Board of Advisors for the Canadian McKenzie Institute. I was going to mention that she was named uh, as a presidential campaign national security advisor to a certain candidate who as of last night is no longer available. So I won't. In any case, uh, anyone could benefit from her good advice and counsel on national security. In fact, since 2013, Claire has served as a member of the Citizens Commission on Benghazi formerly vice president of the Intelligence Summit. She was a career operations officer with the CIA, a professor at the Center for Counterintelligence and Security Studies, executive director of the Iran Policy Committee from 2005 to 2006, particularly dear to my heart because of my own close association with the Claremont Institute. Claire was a Lincoln Fellow there in 2011. Many accomplishments. Uh, they're listed on the bio on, online. Please join me in welcoming her to talk about Gulen and the Gulenist movement. Thank you. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, Bob, and thanks for the invitation to, to be here on this side of the podium tonight. Um, it's um, a pleasure to be with you all, and thanks so many of you for, for coming out this uh, gray, um, drippy night. Um, I did um, want to uh, talk about uh, what we wrote about in this booklet. It's a, it's a monograph size, uh, co-authored with my colleague at the Center for Security Policy, Christopher Holton, who is our Vice President for um, State uh, Legislative Outreach. And we realized um, that there was not only a connection to what is going on in Turkey, uh, but also, by extension, what is now happening here in the United States with this movement. How many have ever heard of Fatula Gulen? Very, well, at least half, I'd say. So great, great. Um, I will explain as we go along. Um, everything I'm going to uh, talk about in here tonight is unclassified. It's all from open sources. Please feel free to, to ask questions. I'll be sure to leave time at the end for questions, too. Uh, as Bob said, this book and a few of the others in our um, uh, Civilization Jihad Reader series are on the table back there for sale. Um, and um, I will be glad to, to uh, follow up uh, with you even afterwards. I have cards on the table back there with my contact info. So please feel free to take one if you'd like, ask where I got something from. Um, that's just a little bit of a visual of some of the things in my background that Bob mentioned. Um, I began uh, right after grad school with no uh, offer letter in my hands, so um, I went off to Marine Corps Officer Candidate School in uh, Quantico, Virginia, and you can see me there a um, long, long time ago. But while I was there, uh, I received the letter that I was really waiting for, and that was the one from the CIA. That was my offer letter that I really wanted. So I finished the course and went into the captain the night before graduation and said, well, I, 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 if I had gone to graduation, uh, the oath of office or the oath of service would have been part of the ceremony. So 
um, I had to I had to leave the night before and um, told them I had this better offer and they paid more money and I didn't have to wear green for the rest of my life. <laughs> and um, so after 20 years undercover CIA around the world, I um, then gravitated to the policy community in Washington, D.C. Um, and eventually where I am now very happily working with Frank Gaffney uh, and the other wonderful folks at the Center for Security Policy. And um, we have been publishing over the last, oh, year, year and a half now, um, this small series of civilization jihad readers, we call them, because they're sort of small and quick and easy to read, mostly um, fewer than 100 pages. And um, we published nine of these last year. Um, I am the editor for all of them and the co-author for a couple of them. Uh, and we're off to a roaring start again this year uh, with more in the pipeline. So stay tuned for that and have a look at our website, centerforsecuritypolicy.org, or you can go to securefreedom.org, same thing. All right, so here is um, uh, the introduction to the book. And um, as I said, my colleague Christopher Holton and I co-authored this uh, at the end of last year. Um, and uh, the concern was not just for what we saw happening in Turkey, uh, but also what we were seeing here in the United States. And um, so we, um, we began with a look at this um, cleric, this uh, Sunni Islamic cleric by the name of Fethullah Gulen. Uh, he is a Turkish Sunni cleric. Um, he is uh, very much part of the jihadist Sufi Ottoman tradition. Um, and he founded um, back in the 20th century um, a, a socio-political movement. He calls it Hizmet, and Hizmet in Turkish means service. That is what the organization is called, um, and he is both founder and spiritual leader for that organization. Uh, it has become a global, worldwide organization in the, in the decades since he founded it, um, and it is, in every sense of the word, uh, an empire, uh, both in the financial sense, uh, business sense, um, and um, uh, otherwise, academic uh, as well as uh, clerical or spiritual. Um, he is the head of a vast network, not just of businesses, and we'll talk about some of those which form the, the financial basis uh, for this empire and fund it to a great extent, um, but also uh, he is at the head of a global network of cultural groups which have a presence, wide, widespread presence here in the United States, and schools. And the schools are the thing that get a lot of people's attention here in the United States, and we'll, we'll get into that. Now, the, um, the ideology uh, for Fatullah Gulen is easy to find. He's got a website. On that website are posted uh, many of his writings, um, fgulen.com and in English. Um, and he, he openly um, and, and publicly tries to project an image of this benign, you know, spirituality, this gentle tolerance um, for uh, all faiths and, and, and so on. Uh, however, when you actually get into reading some of his speeches and some of his writing, um, it's very quick and easy to discern um, a very pro-Sharia and pro-Jihadist uh, bent to his writing. Um, and, and it is in complete sync with the Muslim Brotherhood. Of course, the, uh, the government of Turkey now is a Muslim Brotherhood government, and he was not that far ideologically separated uh, from the uh, president, uh, former prime minister, but now president of Turkey, uh, Erdogan, until a split that we'll talk about uh, that occurred a few years ago. Uh, but ideologically, uh, jihad, Sharia, Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, there is no overt connection between the Gulen movement or Fatullah Gulen himself and the Muslim Brotherhood. So make that point clear. There's no particular um, you know, connection that, that can be demonstrated. However, what I'm saying is that the ideology is one and the same. Um, so uh, we know that back in the 20th century, and I think, yeah, um, Kemal Ataturk, um, who's pictured here next to the Turkish flag, uh, was uh, the, the leader of Turkey um, and what was left really of the Ottoman Empire, the Turkish state, the rump state almost, if you will, uh, after World War I, uh, which Turkey lost and uh, lost uh, its, its empire, the Ottoman Empire, 
uh, was no more after World War I, but what was left became the modern state of Turkey, and uh, this uh, Kemal Ataturk, uh, Ataturk, by the way, is a nickname in a way, meaning father of the Turkish people, right? Got that right? Okay. Uh, but his actual name is Mustafa, Mustafa Kemal, uh, but he, he, he was given or took the name uh, Ataturk as a kind of a, uh, a nickname uh, because of his role, his, his very dominant role um, after World War I in Turkey. Um, uh, during a time uh, in the early decades of the 20th century when he tried very hard uh, to drag Turkey, kicking and screaming, as it were, into the 20th century. Um, Turkey did not um, go willingly, uh, but he was, he was a tough leader. And um, he uh, not only modernized uh, the Turkish state in terms of administration of the state, in terms of the military, uh, the infrastructure like roads and, and railroads and, and the education system, um, but he determinedly secularized Turkey. Uh, laws were passed that actually dictated dress codes. Um, the, the typical men's cap, uh, you may uh, remember this image of a, uh, a round cap with a, a tassel on the top called a fez, was outlawed by law. Uh, women were not to wear the hijab uh, in public or in public places. Um, so even down to the dress codes, he, uh, d he, he, he secularized uh, Turkey and attempted to um, make it a modern and a secular state. Um, in many of the infrastructure um, enterprises, he succeeded quite well, and, and Turkey developed um, by leaps and bounds during, during this time. Uh, but in terms of secularizing Turkey, uh, it was less of a long-term successful venture. Four times during the 20th century, uh, the Turkish military, which was the defender of the Kemalist revolution or the Kemalist um, program, if you will, stepped in. Um, I, I wouldn't call them exactly coup d'etats because they weren't to overthrow the government, uh, but rather to return the government uh, and the state to its secular pathway um, and its, its uh, Kemalist pathway. Um, and then they returned back to the barracks. The, the military did not ever hang on to power, but they returned back to the barracks after they had uh, returned Turkey to its course. But it took four interventions uh, by the military during the 20th century to keep Turkey on that modernization, secularization path because the influences uh, within the population, um, deep within the traditions uh, of Turkey, of course dating back to hundreds of years of the Ottoman Empire, um, were very decidedly um, conservative and, uh, and, and conservative Muslim, jihadist. Uh, and, and it tried, that, that, that secular, or that, that um, conservative tradition repeatedly tried to drag Turkey back, back, back uh, into its Ottoman past, its jihadist past. Um, during the 20th century, that did not succeed. However, uh, now uh, there is uh, this president, uh, Erdogan, who formerly was the prime minister and is now the, the, the president of Turkey, um, elected, democratically elected, um, but he has rather different ideas about uh, what Turkey should be and what it should look like. And this is a quote from him about democracy from some time ago. Democracy is like a train, he said. Uh, once uh, you, uh, you, you get off, once you have reached your destination. Um, meaning, of course, that he is willing to use the democratic process essentially to subvert a liberal democracy. Um, and what is happening in Turkey now is an increasingly dictatorial style of government on the part of Erdogan and the party, Justice and Development Party, or AKP, um, which heads up uh, Turkey today. And more and more, um, he is cracking down hard on the uh, former military, uh, many of whom, senior military officers, were charged with crimes, uh, wound up in jail, uh, had uh, long extended um, court cases uh, lodged against them. Uh, some of those have just been recently overturned, actually, uh, by the high court. Uh, but nevertheless, the power of the Turkish military 
um, effectively has been broken uh, under Erdogan, and that military is no longer the defender of the Kemalist agenda or program of the 20th century. Um, now, for a long time, as I said, um, the ideology of, of uh, the AKP party, of Erdogan, and of uh, Fethullah Gulen, um, that ideology was very similar. It was very much aligned. It was very much um, uh, in, in the same uh, spirit of uh, traditional, authoritative, orthodox Islam, uh, meaning Sharia adherence, uh, commitment to jihad. Um, not overtly. Um, this is a gradual thing, especially as you may know, uh, with the Muslim Brotherhood, the, um, uh, the, the tactic, or even strategy perhaps, to make it uh, overarching, uh, is a gradualist one. If you've ever read Syed Qutb, one of the key theoreticians of the Muslim Brotherhood, and his special uh, you know, key monograph called Milestones, he talks about uh, instituting Sharia gradually. In other words, the milestones uh, referred to in the title of that book of his mean the milestones on a highway, you know, my, the mile markers, mile one, two, three, five, ten gradually uh, introducing a society, bringing a society along uh, to uh, eventually a full expression of Sharia adherence and commitment to jihad. Um, so Erdogan is, and, and, and Gulen for a long time had been very much in that gradualist tradition aligned and uh, in, in many ways um, allies. However, um, as was perhaps inevitable, uh, two powerful men uh, eventually came to a falling out, and that only took place a few years ago. Um, and uh, at that point in time, about 2013 and onwards, the split between them uh, is, is pretty much, uh, it, it's, it's, they have broken the relationship. Let me go back then uh, to, to talk about uh, the life of Fethullah Gulen just a little bit. He was born in 1938. Uh, that is for, I mean, uh, kind of strikingly, the same year uh, that Mustafa Kemal Ataturk died, 1938. His father uh, was an imam in an eastern Turkish village, and he wanted his son to follow in his footsteps, uh, to be perhaps an imam, but certainly um, to, to uh, be a uh, firm and deep believer in uh, Islam. Um, I talked about the intervention of the Turkish military during the 20th century four times, um, the, the tendency of the village where uh, the, the uh, uh, family of Golan um, was, was located um, and, and, and of the deep uh, conservative population of Turkey, of course, was very much against and resented uh, those interventions by the military and really wanted Turkey to go back uh, to what it was before. If you can imagine, um, since the time we are told that Muhammad died in the year 632 until the beginning of the 20th century when uh, Ataturk abolished the last caliphate in 1924, there had never been a time when the Muslim world was without a caliphate. I mean, sometimes there were two of them or more, and they fought each other, but there was always a caliphate. There had never not been a caliphate. And all of a sudden, 1924, there's no caliphate anymore. I mean, it had been uh, eroding as an institution for a long time. Uh, it had, um, as well as the Turkish state, um, had, had been declining in, in power and, and, and vibrancy, to be sure. But it had never been abolished or not there. So when it was abolished, this was a blow, I mean, to, to the Muslim world all over, all over the world. And um, a catastrophe, really. Uh, they felt leaderless, rudderless, uh, without a caliphate. Um, and indeed, this was at least part of the instigation for the establishment of the Muslim Brotherhood uh, in Egypt uh, by Hassan al-Banna, a student at Cairo University, four years after that, that is in 1928. Uh, the formation of the Muslim Brotherhood was in direct response, at least in part, to the abolition of the caliphate and was intended to work towards the re-establishment of the caliphate under global, I mean, the, the ambition was global, uh, Islamic law, Sharia. Uh, and indeed, that is what all jihadist individuals or groups seek. Global caliphate, 
the Shiites might call it an imamate, but same idea, an Islamic government under Sharia, under Islamic law. So uh, among this conservative population, very large conservative population in the villages in the countryside of Turkey where Gulen was born and grew up, um, this, this sentiment of, of wanting to get back to a caliphate, wanting to get back to a time when Islam was di uh, dynamic and vibrant and expanding uh, was very strong and they never let go of that even while the military and Ataturk uh, were, were very hard at work trying to modernize Turkey. Um, so as Gulen grew up, um, he, be, he, he came under the influence of uh, some schools of thought, and we'll talk about that in just a moment, that led him uh, increasingly uh, down an academic path. He was a teacher and a preacher, um, and a path um, that led him to want to return Turkey and Turks, the Turkish people, to Islam, uh, and even uh, to a new caliphate. So the Nurtsu, is that the way I should say it? Nurtsu movement um, was founded by Sheikh Said, Saidi Kurdi, um, and uh, also known as Saidi Nursi, who lived uh, these dates, as you can see, at the end of the 19th into the 20th century. And um, he set up what is called reading circles. These were just um, home gatherings, gatherings in people's houses uh, for students and followers um, to uh, read texts, to study texts, to study Islam, um, but essentially uh, to, to uh, organize a group and a movement among the young, among the students, uh, who would oppose these modernizing um, ambitions and, and program of, of Kemal Ataturk. And eventually uh, those reading circles, as they called them, uh, crystallized into a movement uh, to return Turkey, of course, to Islamic principles under Sharia. And Gulen, as a young man, was very much captivated uh, by Norsi, uh, attended his reading circles, um, and, and was, was deeply influenced by him and became his devoted follower. Um, so as, as he grew older then, uh, Gulen more and more turned to, from student uh, to become a teacher and a preacher himself. And um, his organization, which as I mentioned, called Hizmet, uh, began to take shape in the 1960s and on into the 1970s. And then he really established schools uh, within this movement by the 1980s. And he himself then began to attract uh, a following of his own students uh, as he grew in reputation uh, and following. Um, and he is often described, um, you can, you can see this in media and elsewhere as a moderate um, Muslim. I'm not quite sure what that means, but basically what he was more, I think, and you'll see it in this quote, is someone dedicated to the Syed Qutb uh, strategy of gradualism moving stealthily, quietly. As he says here, um, you must move in the arteries of the system without anyone noticing your existence until you reach all the power centers, until the conditions are ripe. They, meaning the followers, must continue like this. Now that was not ever meant to be a public statement, but it, it did uh, <coughs> become public, it, was, it became known. And so this, I think, crystallizes um, Gulen's approach uh, as a teacher and a preacher and a founder and establisher if you will, of these schools. This was his intent, this was his strategy. So uh, over the decades then, um, many, many graduates, hundreds of graduates uh, came through these schools of his, uh, came through, um, you know, influenced by him uh, and moved on, uh, as they would, into Turkish businesses, into the media, the judiciary, and the police, especially uh, as part of the Turkish government. Um, and those alumni form the base of the Gulen Empire in Turkey. And I, by empire, I am talking about a financial empire uh, for those who went into business and became very successful in, in those different kinds of businesses. Um, media was a key um, sector of society, if you will, pillar of society, uh, which to penetrate um, for the purposes of, of influence. And then, of course, into the um, administration uh, itself, in particular the judiciary, meaning prosecutors and judges, and also uh, the Turkish police force. 
Um, and so uh, through, through the years, these, these alumni, these graduates, strongly influenced by the Golan um, think, thinking, his thoughts, um, became very wealthy, very powerful, very influential. Not just in Turkey alone, but throughout the Turkic speaking um, regions. And, and that would extend further into, let's say, Central Asia uh, and elsewhere around the world. Um, they uh, categorized, uh, Gulen categorized uh, his followers uh, into three groups, and he would call them followers, sympathizers, and then the inner circle of workers. And these, just these designations simply meant how closely affiliated these followers, all followers, they were all followers, were, um, you know, with the actual work of establishing the schools and the movement itself. Now, obviously, uh, Gulen was going to come into conflict uh, with the Turkish government of that time, meaning we're still in the 20th century here. Um, and uh, in fact, uh, he was uh, charged with offenses in the 1990s. Uh, and um, just ahead of uh, prosecution, he came to the United States in 1998, or I think it might have been 1999, actually. I might have that year a little bit off. Um, but he fled um, to avoid that prosecution and was given safe haven in the United States. He settled at this um, lovely compound here um, in, uh, or near Sailorsburg, Pennsylvania, and this is in the Poconos Mountains area of Pennsylvania, where he lives to this day. It is a guarded compound. It is uh, patrolled by armed guards, uh, and he has been there uh, ever since he arrived. Uh, in the year 2008, he was granted permanent resident status, uh, which means that by now, being the year 2016, he would be eligible for citizenship. I think it takes seven years after you get your permanent resident status to be eligible. Now, I have no idea whether he wants to become a citizen or not, but the eligibility, I believe, is there after seven years. All right. I was talking a little bit before I referred to the split um, that occurred between Golan and uh, uh, Erdogan. And as I said earlier on, uh, they were ideological soulmates for many, many years. They, they, and, and they still, to this day, really are, are, are uh, followers and, and believers in the same ideology, which is a Muslim Brotherhood type of ideology committed to uh, Sharia, adherence, Islamic supremacism, and of course jihad to achieve all of that. However, because of that broad following that Gulen had attracted through his student graduates, and as we said, they were placed into all these influential positions throughout uh, Turkish society, government, uh, academia themselves, uh, media, and uh, the, uh, the legal infrastructure of the country, Sooner or later, it was pretty much guaranteed that these two men were going to come into conflict, um, not over the ideology, but rather over who gets to be uh, on top, who gets to hold uh, you know, and wield um, the most power. These are some covers of um, the uh, Economist magazine over the last couple of years. The most recent one is this one up in the right-hand corner, which is only, I think, a couple weeks ago. Um, and so you can see that um, the, uh, the media, and of course The Economist is a British publication, right, out of the UK. Um, but, but broadly speaking, um, there is um, characterization of the increasingly dictatorial style of President Erdogan uh, as um, Ottoman-like, or uh, uh, indicating that, that he um, would like to return uh, to the days of, uh, you know, the Ottoman Empire. Uh, with the uh, insinuation that he would be the new sultan. Um, so uh, it, it was inevitable, as I said, and, and uh, Erdogan uh, needed to move against Gulen and his followers in order to consolidate his own uh, grip on political power and that of the AKP, the, uh, uh, the party. And so um, what happened is that um, because Gulen's followers were so infiltrated into the judicial system, the police system, um, they were in positions to investigate, to open investigations, to prosecute followers of Erdogan. And uh, they made a power play, uh, and they lost. And Erdogan cracked down, beginning in 2013, continuing to this day. 
Um, and uh, especially, as I said, on the military, although that was long time coming even before that, but on the journalists in particular, anyone who wants to write about this, a journalist in Turkey, um, I don't know if it's the highest per capita number of journalists in jail or not, China might vie for that, or maybe Iran, but it's up there in terms of, of, of journalists jailed in Turkey for investigating or writing about these topics. Um, and finally, um, Erdogan actually declared Gulen a terrorist and his Gulenist movement, uh, a terrorist organization, put them on their list. He actually also uh, has issued a number of arrest warrants for Gulen. I think the number might be up to four by now. Kind of lose track after a while. Uh, but I think it's four, but he will not be extradited from the United States. The United States will not extradite him to Turkey. Uh, but however, those, those um, uh, arrest warrants are out there and mean that he really cannot travel outside of the United States. But, you know, that, that compound looks kind of comfy to me, so yeah. maybe he's okay. <laughs> um, so Fatullah Gulen, uh, uh, somebody just sent me uh, this billboard picture. Um, and it, it's, it's in the United States on a highway someplace, but I have to tell you, I don't know exactly where. Uh, somebody just sent this to me a couple of uh, days ago. Um, but very clever. I thought it was very illustrative and very clever um, of how Gulen and, and uh, others like him, um, not just on the surface that he's fighting back against Erdogan, right, that he's an Islamic scholar and he looks, you know, so professional in his suit jacket and, and, you know, he just looks like a grandfather, doesn't he? I mean, just, just like a nice guy. But the billboard says, of course, a real Muslim cannot be a terrorist. Now, actually, if you understand the language that is used by Muslims, by jihadis in particular, um, this is a true statement. Because what is a terrorist in the Islamic definition of the term? A terrorist is one who takes a Muslim life without right, who kills a Muslim without right. Well, what is right? Right is if that Muslim uh, commits adultery, apostasy, is a homosexual, or commits the, uh, the nice catch-all, they always have a catch-all, <coughs> mischief in the land. And of course, this comes from verse 532 and then the punishments in 533 of the Quran. And so, um, what they will never call themselves is a terrorist. According to their firm belief, they are not terrorists. A terrorist is one who takes a Muslim life without right. That's not what they're doing. They are jihadis. What is jihad? Jihad is warfare against the non-Muslim. That's what the Book of Law says. Hmm? The infidel. Against the infidel. That is right. And. Um, so a jihadi is one who fights in the way of Allah, fi sabil Allah, in the way of Allah. And uh, that could never be a terrorist. That is a jihadi. So again, this billboard has multiple layers to it. And you kind of have to unpack it to get everything that, that's going on. And anyway, I thought it was a, a great uh, image. Um, and uh, he is, um, I don't know how many of them are out there or, or if they're in multiple places or states, but. Uh, I just have this one photo for the moment. All right, let's bring it over to the United States because uh, this is where the concern comes in. You know, if this were happening only in Turkey and this power struggle were going on only in Turkey and the Kemalist um, program for Turkey, the modernization, uh, the secularization program were only being overturned in Turkey, we would say, well, you know, this is of great concern because Turkey is a NATO ally but it's not quite the same concern as when it's taking place right here in the homeland in the United States. But Gulen is establishing a presence and a network inside the United States. Not just the United States, worldwide. But we're going to focus on the United States for the remainder here. Um, that network in the United States consists of cultural centers and charter schools in particular uh, across the U.S. Um, there are a lot of concerns with both of these. Uh, some of the schools are under legal investigation, I mean by the FBI and other uh, law enforcement, some of it local, some of it federal. Um, the allegations involve things like influence operations. Uh, they involve um, misuse of the H-1B uh, visa system uh, to bring in uh, Turkish 
or Turkic speaking uh, teachers. Um, they involve allegations that some of the teachers in the um, Gulen charter schools have been coerced uh, to kick back a large percentage. I mean, I've, I've seen allegations as high as 40% of their salary in cash uh, each month to kick it back to the Gulen movement, um, meaning it goes to the Poconos, to that nice compound uh, in, in the Poconos. So these are the allegations and these are some of the concerns um, you know, that certainly that motivated us at the center uh, to undertake this research uh, for this monograph, but also to bring it to you and explain what, what, what we found in our research. So uh, beginning from 1999 onwards, that is from the time when Fatullah Gulen uh, came to the United States until the present, uh, we have about 150, it might be more than that now, uh, K through 12 Gulen charter schools established across the United States in 23 different states with a total of 60,000 and perhaps more uh, students enrolled in those schools. The thing about charter schools, and this is different from other countries, the way uh, we, we set up our education system, of course there's the public education system, which is completely paid for by taxpayer dollars. There is the private school system, which is paid for by different constituencies who establish private schools. And then there's this kind of hybrid thing called charter schools. Nobody else that I know of in the world has this. Uh, but these are largely funded by US taxpayer dollars. In other words, in lieu of the students attending a public school, on taxpayer dollars. The taxpayer dollars have to go to the charter schools because they've elected to attend them instead. Uh, and it amounts at the moment, I mean, this, this is just an estimate uh, that I know of at the moment, $600 million per year of US taxpayer money going to this particular network of charter schools across the states. Uh, in addition to these K through 12 schools, uh, there are also three universities in the United States uh, they are the Virginia International University, located in Fairfax, Virginia, not far from here. Around the corner from me. Uh, very close, okay. I have no idea. All right, there's one. The American Islamic College, located in Chicago, Illinois, and the North American University in Houston, Texas. Uh, those are the three universities. Now, uh, this is just the United States, okay? We're only focusing on the U.S. There are K through 12 and elementary uh, and universities uh, schools and universities all over the world, but this is just for the United States. Now, typically, the Gulen schools um, in the United States will uh, tout a STEM curriculum, and as you know, that stands for science, technology, engineering, and math, uh, which is a very attractive uh, kind of a curriculum, especially for uh, areas that might be not well served um, by the public school system. Um, you know, underprivileged areas, uh, places where the school system is not very good. Uh, that is where the Gulen system moves in and, and offers the STEM curriculum at their K through 12 charter schools. And parents just eat it. I mean, if you were a parent, any of us who are parents, in, 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 a, in a, um, you know, a very um, poor public school system, and something like this comes along and, and offers, um, a rigorous, uh, you know, uh, curriculum for your for your child, and it's going to be paid for by taxpayer dollars. Well, you know, you're a parent. What's not to love? Well, how much time do we have? Um, okay. So they often um, have names. Um, the the schools or the school systems have names like Cosmos, Harmony, Horizon. Um, they sound really galactic and dreamy and, 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 and just, you know, parents just love this. Um, the schools uh, avoid any overt uh, acknowledgement or connection to the Gulen movement. And when school administrators or teachers are asked directly about such an affiliation, most often they will deny it and say, no, 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 we don't, no, no, that's not, we have no connection to that. Um, but they are connected. Now, perhaps all the teachers don't know it, but, you know. Um, what, is, what is the evidence of that? The evidence of what? The connections. Oh, of the connections. Way more intelligent. Yeah, well, the evidence of the connections, yeah, they're, they're, uh, the, the schools themselves, where they come from, the teachers, and, and we'll talk about all of this here. Um, there have been a lot of problems um, with these schools, a lot of allegations. 
Um, I'm not going to say that all of the allegations have been proven. Many of these investigations are still ongoing. Uh, so far, the FBI has actually raided uh, schools, um, uh, Gulen schools in four different states. But so far, to the best of my knowledge, there are no either local law enforcement or Department of Justice prosecutions underway as a result of those allegations. Um, what they offer in addition to the STEM curriculum uh, is a very strongly Turkic-centric curriculum um, that is uh, very strongly focused on the history, the culture, the language of Turkey, but as I said, the broader Turkic culture um, of, of the region and into Central Asia. Um, many of the teachers who teach at these schools are brought in on H-1B visas, uh, which as you may know is a special category of visa uh, that is supposed to be for employers who cannot find uh, an, a, an appropriate um, U.S. Um, citizen uh, uh, to fill that, that position. Uh, and they are supposed to advertise the position and put it out, uh, you know, publicly. And, and then after a search, if they can't find anybody, I mean, if you need, you know, a, um, a French chef uh, for a five-star restaurant, it may well be that you need to bring somebody in from Paris. But the allegations on these visas and the, the allegations of misuse um, center on the fact that um, there are many, many teachers being brought into these schools on such visas, uh, including some with not that great English language skills who are being brought in to teach English. Um, and so those allegations. Uh, there are allegations of um, uh, gender um, bias allegations. In other words, that practically 100% of the teachers brought in under these visas on this system are males, they're men. And the vast majority of those teaching in the Gulen schools are men, uh, whether they be local Americans or um, Turkish um, teachers coming in. Uh, investigations are ongoing over allegations, as I said, of those salary kickbacks. Uh, allegations of the establishment of prayer rooms inside of a school, a public school. Uh, and then this whole thing about the trips, all expense paid trips uh, for students, teachers, administration, uh, administrators, uh, and others in the community. And we'll talk about uh, some of those allegations even beyond the school system. Let me talk just a little bit briefly about some of the uh, local area um, connections uh, to the Gulen system. Um, a few years ago, well, it's more than a few now, um, the, um, the, the Gulen movement sought to establish a STEM curriculum school in Loudoun County. They were going to call it the Math and Information Technology Academy. This is an artist's rendering of, of what the uh, facility would look like. Um, however, the proposal was very poorly prepared, um, contained many errors, and uh, parents and residents uh, in Loudoun County became aware of this and um, organized uh, to oppose uh, the establishment of the school, uh, primarily based on uh, the very poor uh, proposal advanced uh, to set it up. And on that basis, eventually, indeed, uh, the proposal was denied and the school uh, was not set up. Uh, as far as I know, by the way, um, I have not found any Gulen uh, K through 12 uh, schools in Virginia. Uh, they're in many other states, but I don't know of any K through 12 uh, in Virginia, this one having been uh, turned down. I will talk about the Harmony system, which is headquartered in Texas, um, because it is probably the largest network of Gulen schools in the country, and now um, includes the establishment of affiliated schools outside of Texas also. But it began in Texas uh, in about the year 2000, uh, near Houston, Texas is where it all began. And uh, by now, today, 2016, 16 years later, um, the K through 12 schools in the Harmony Charter system of Texas enroll around 25,000 mm -hmm. students. Um, as you know, often is the case, the schools are lauded for their academic excellence, the STEM curriculum, of course. Um, they receive hundreds of thousands of taxpayer dollars uh, annually just for these schools, the Harmony schools in Texas. And there's a list, it's, it's not even a complete list, um, but of some of the cities in Texas where 
a Harmony K through 12 school um, is functioning, is, is um, in operation. So you can see quite a few cities there. Um, in Washington, D.C., uh, there is a Harmony Charter School. That's its logo that you see there, and it's also the website up there. Uh, it's a K through five, only kindergarten through the fifth grade. Uh, charter School, it was just opened a bit ago, 2014-2015 school year, so I guess this is now the second, um, completing the second school year, academic year. Uh, it's located, as you see, in uh, Northeast Washington, D.C. Again, um, I, I'll point out with that one that it is the um, underserved areas of, of public school, the public school system that are the most attractive for parents when a Harmony or a, a, a Gulen school comes in because the parents are at their wits end to get you know, good education for their kids. And this, this um, uh, you know, system comes in touting all of these benefits of a STEM curriculum and so forth and the parents are, are really very delighted. Um, and some of them indeed show good results. Uh, some of these schools around the country actually do show good academic outcomes. Uh, that's not necessarily the only uh, issue, however, or the only problem. Uh, late last year, USA Today broke the story um, uh, about the Gulen movement funding more than 200 trips, all expense paid trips to Turkey uh, since 2008, so that would be over the preceding seven or so years, uh, by members of Congress, the US Congress. Uh, the problem is that um, the Gulen uh, movement hid uh, its involvement fraudulently. And it was a, a group of non-governmental organizations or non-profits that put their names forward on the applications um, for these members or the invitations for these members who um, are obliged uh, by the rules of, of Congress to submit uh, their um, trips like these when they're being paid for uh, by someone else to the House Ethics Committee, uh, which perhaps did not do quite enough due diligence but approved them. So there's no blame uh, to attach here, uh, no implied blame uh, that I'm, I'm uh, you know, alleging on the part of the House, uh, the congressional members, and maybe not even on the Ethics Committee because they were deceived. Maybe they should have done a better job of due diligence, um, but they were deceived by the application process, um, which used front groups, um, and in fact, uh, it comes out, uh, in fact, all of those invitations were, in fact, from the Gulen movement. Um, the other allegation that is under investigation right now is that some members of Congress um, have received thousands of dollars in campaign cash uh, from, again, organizations purporting to be NGOs or non-profits, maybe Turkish cultural centers or the like, uh, when in fact, again, behind, behind uh, is the Gulen movement. Um, additionally, there are allegations that the schools, the Gulen charter schools, um, preferentially uh, give their contracts, you know, from maintenance or repairs or what have you at the schools to Turkish firms. Um, and so there are allegations that the bidding process, the contract process, um, has not been done in a legal way. Uh, there are Justice Department criminal investigations uh, underway for those uh, allegations right there. Um, in addition to the school network in the United States, uh, Gulen has also established a much broader empire, if you will, um, in, in the states. And these include businesses, uh, cultural centers, um, various uh, elements of the media, think tank affiliates, and you'll find um, some lists of those in appendices at the back of our monograph, um, which I found in different places online, and, and you can too, I can point you in that direction. Um, but so it's not just the school network, it is all of these others, just as Gulen did originally in Turkey now establishing this kind of a broad-based network here in the United States. I'm giving you just one example of those rather than going through the whole list or, uh, of all of them, but uh, this one called the Raindrop Turkish House, or sometimes called the Raindrop Foundation, uh, is located uh, near uh, downtown Houston, Texas, and it sponsors Turkish cultural events, uh, sports, and oh yes, 
all expense paid trips to Turkey. The people that they target um, for these invitations to Turkey, as I said, are, are not just the school of teachers, administrators, and students, but also journalists whom they hope you know, will come back and write favorable stories about them, and uh, faith community leaders, uh, Jewish faith uh, community leaders, Christian leaders, ministers, rabbis, and so forth, are especially targeted um, to, to receive these invitations for trips to Turkey. And if they're, they're marvelous trips. Um, I want to mention here, uh, with re regard to those faith communities, the interfaith dialogue movement. The Gulen movement is deeply involved in the interfaith dialogue movement. You can see references to that at their website, the Gulen uh, website. Um, it, just as the Muslim Brotherhood is deeply involved in the interfaith dialogue movement, and of course, as you probably know, Saul Alinsky uh, was the founder of the interfaith dialogue movement in the United States uh, with his uh, organization called the Industrial Areas Foundation. Now that IAF um, is explicitly linked uh, currently with the, the Muslim Brotherhood in the United States and with the Muslim Brotherhood's new political entity called the USCMO, United States Council of Muslim Organizations. Uh, a book in the back on the table there is called uh, Star Spangled Sharia. And uh, that book is all about the establishment of this Muslim Brotherhood political entity, umbrella group, if you will, uh, called the USCMO. In any case, all of the above and the Gulen movement are very closely involved in the interfaith dialogue movement. And so again, it's this um, attempt to project an image of peace and love and harmony and you know, cosmic serenity or, or what have you. Um, through the different activities that they sponsor, uh, luncheons, um, uh, athletic uh, or family day events, um, uh, and, and, and they invite, as I said, a wide range of different faith community leaders, but I would say particularly uh, Christian, you know, ministers, priests, etc., and rabbis uh, of the Jewish faith. Um, however, and we're coming to a conclusion here, um, it's not hard um, to find out what uh, Gulen really stands for. And again, uh, he has published quite a bit. And at his own website uh, here, uh, noted on the slide, um, are num a number of his essays and, and uh, uh, writings. One of them is called Prophet Muhammad as Commander. And Chris Holton, my, my co-author uh, of this, this monograph here, did a marvelous job um, as we were doing the research for this book on this particular essay called Prophet Muhammad as Commander. Um, and uh, it has many different sub uh, chapters in it on the website, but every last one of them aligned and covered down with Islamic doctrine uh, about Islamic supremacism, jihad, and Sharia. And of course, Muhammad as Commander means as military commander, commander of, of jihad um, in, uh, in that time. Um, in the essay as well, uh, Gulen does not hesitate to talk about the obligation to jihad, uh, enmity to unbelievers. Um, you might have heard the phrase awala uh, wabara, which means enmity and uh, friendship, and uh, that is a core doctrine of Islam. Uh, and then the doctrine of enjoin the good, forbid the evil. This is an especially important one. Let me spend just a moment here with it. And join the good, forbid the evil is, is essentially a commandment within Islam. And it means that every Muslim faithful believer, one who faithfully follows uh, Islam and Sharia, is obligated um, not just themselves uh, to, to behave in accordance with Islamic law, but rather to make sure that everybody else does too. And not just Muslims, but also <coughs> non-Muslims. So to enjoin the good means to encourage it to, uh, uh, to, to work towards uh, its, its and, and the definition of, of the good, of course, would be within Islam. Uh, that's what we're talking about. We're not talking about the Ten Commandments here. Um, it is enjoin uh, Islamic good, enjoin Islamic law, Sharia, uh, and forbid the evil. This is, this is the um, ominous part of this phrase here. Forbid the evil means not just to speak up when you see something uh, that um, is, is, is against Islamic law, or to remonstrate with your family member or friend or a fellow Muslim at the, at the mosque. 
uh, about you know why were you eating pork or drinking alcohol or whatever it was. No, this is also a much more than that. Remonstrating or or um, you know trying to persuade the person who's done this wrong under Islamic law is only the first step. If the person, be they Muslim or non-Muslim, does not does not come along, does not change their behavior to align with Islamic law then the Muslim is obligated under Islamic law to go further to force and, and not, just, not just persuade, but actually to take eventually at the end of a, a, a series of, of potential actions, physical action, uh, to, to compel uh, the person to um, alignment or to obedience to uh, Islamic law. Now this becomes particularly um, problematic, I would say, uh, when people who want to instruct or teach about Islam um, are, are, given, are, are faced with accusations of Islamophobia. What is Islamophobia? It's an accusation of slander. Slander under Islamic law is, quote, anything that would offend a Muslim, unquote. And the penalty for disobeying that law can be death, capital punishment. So you see where this goes. Now, for instance, last year in the summer of 2015, I and a number of colleagues, 12 of us women in all, were featured in a publication of the Southern Poverty Law Center called the Intelligence Report. It's an online subscription report that they put out. And in their summer 2015 issue, they devoted the whole issue to what they called uh, Women Against Islam, The Dirty Dozen. <laughs> And they profiled each one of us with an artist's sketch uh, of, of us and uh, our hometown and our, uh, you know, as much about our bio as they could find, I guess through the internet, because some of it's a little off. But among, among this dirty dozen group, we have Judge Jeanine Pirro from Fox News. We have Sandy Rios, a wonderful talk show host, radio uh, show host. Uh, Brigitte Gabriel is on that list. Um, and Coulter's on the list, uh, and, and, and as I said, a whole dozen. Now, what is that? That's a hit list. Now, whether the SPLC understands what they've done or not, that's an invitation to <coughs> enjoin the good, forbid the evil, you see? So there's that, and uh, that is very much integral to the writings of Fatullah Gulen online, uh, the, um, the uh, fight, as he would see it, to impose true justice. The word justice in Islam means only Sharia. That's all it means and nothing else. Justice <coughs> under Islam is Sharia. All right, um, finally, last one here. I want to recommend to you a new film uh, that is just out. Indeed, its premiere was last Friday uh, in New York. It's called Killing Ed. Ed means education, not, not a person. Um, and uh, the DVD, as I understand it, was just released. It will be, if it is not already, available on Amazon, and I think I've heard through Barnes & Noble as well. Um, Mark Hall uh, is the, uh, the producer of this film, and it is about the Gulen movement's use of US taxpayer funds for many of the same things that we have been, just been discussing tonight. It's amazing because he was working on his film, unbeknownst to me, at the same time, uh, that Chris Holton and I were working on on this monograph and neither none of us none of the three of us knew the other at the time until uh, each uh, the film and the book uh, was near completion and then then we got in connection with each other and it's it's amazing the overlap uh, that we came to independently in the topics that I've just described to you from the book and in his DVD so I highly recommend that to you uh, and uh, with that, I will welcome your questions. Thank you. Um, do they uh, sort of kind of connected? Um, do they aim then not just with interfaith dialogue, but with the schools to um, have non-Muslim students attend the charter schools? Do yes. They, do they work to convert people to Islam? No. The uh, question is, uh, do the schools, the, char the Gulen charter schools in the United States include um, Muslim or and or other students? Uh, as I said, because a lot of these schools are situated in underserved, let's say, inner city uh, areas or where the public schools are especially poor, 
um, the intent, the whole intent is to bring in non-Muslim students. And indeed, the vast majority of the students in these schools are not Muslim, many from inner city um, um, areas. And then, do they indoctrinate? No. Overtly in the school, there is no Islamic curriculum, per se. Now, like I said, it is heavily uh, pro-Turkish in the teaching of Turkish history, Turkish culture, Turkish language even becomes a requirement at certain levels and in certain schools to take the language. And then, of course, you know, the various cultural um, you know, events at the school uh, that, that surround uh, the, the curriculum itself, meaning uh, different after-school activities, club activities, and then, of course, these invitations to the trips. So no, it's, not, it's, it's, it's much more subtle than just an overt um, attempt to, to you know, convert students to Islam. They're not doing that, they no. They teach religion. They do not teach religion, no. These are public schools. I mean, they're still under the U.S. public school system, except this adjunct sort of category of charter schools. But they're still U.S. public schools. So no, they do not teach religion. Uh, but they are, in a way, um, teaching the children an appreciation for Turkic culture, Turkic language, Turkish uh, history and figures in history and so forth, which sort of paves the way for them, and especially if they then go on a trip, uh, to Turkey, where they'll have even more exposure. Uh, Claire, if I could just ask a question. If Erdogan has successfully suppressed the Gulenist movement inside Turkey, its home base, hasn't it therefore lost power to a considerable extent and presents less of a threat? Well, I, I, inside Turkey, yes. Um, at the moment, Erdogan has succeeded um, in, in suppressing um, much of the, of the Gulen movement. But remember, he's got thousands of graduates from over the decades who are, are working all throughout Turkey in all these different areas. You know, we talked about business and media and academia and government. There's no way they can, they can get them all out. Now, there, he's being very, Erdogan is being very heavy handed in terms of um, making arrests and allegations and, and cases, legal cases against people. Um, but, and at the moment it looks like you know, Erdogan has the upper hand, and indeed he does. But I don't think that's the end of, of Gulen uh, inside Turkey either. And especially because this is a personal power struggle between two men, it's not about the ideology. The ideology is common to both of them and many others inside Turkey. Um, this is a power struggle between two men, and, and, and I would just say that his students number in the thousands. So they're still there. They're not all in jail. Let me start from the front and I'll work to the back. Paul, go ahead. Just a uh, little perspective and then, uh, and then a question. I, we moved from Houston two years ago. And uh -huh. so, and I, they're, they're all over. Oh, we moved from Houston two years ago. Um, I'd been in uh, at least one of the Gulen schools. It was a polling place uh -huh. uh, where we were there. Um, and yeah, it's just the, the appeal, what you said is exa exactly right. The appeal for parents is, uh, they're, they're presented as very moderate and School of Excellence is another title that they take mm -hmm. along. And so, uh, yeah. so it's quite appealing. My question is, number one, uh, you see the trajectory, and obviously I think you did a great job of presenting it. Where do you think this is going? Where will it be in 10 years? And secondly, what do you think is an appropriate uh, response, policy response, uh, considering those Okay, so, so yeah. where are we, where are we going, and, and what where kind of a response? Where, where are they where, going? Where are they headed? Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously they're looking to expand the network, certainly of schools. The cultural centers number in the thousands across the U.S. Um, and, and like I said, they are very often presented as nonprofit groups or NGOs of various kinds, cultural centers and so forth. Um, so those are, sim are still expanding. They're, they're, they're still, and there's, you know, there's nothing illegal about it. No, and it's not illegal at all. Yeah. You know, it's very, um, very sophisticated. And um, the schools, though, are another question, um, simply because so many of them have come under scrutiny um, by increasingly aware parents, mm -hmm. um, as well as local communities like journalists included, um, and you know, the, the, the legal authorities who have been called in on, on numbers of occasions to different schools on these various allegations. And as I said, um, a lot of these allegations remain right now under investigation and more surely will be forthcoming. So that 
um, may put a bit of a damper on um, you know, further school expansion. As, as you can see, um, what took place in Loudoun County some years ago when uh, the citizens were um, informed enough uh, that they formed you know, an organize, organized opposition and succeeded. And that, that is happening more and more. So again, it's, it's the, uh, you know, getting the information out there that, that is so important in, in, into the hands especially of parents you know, and local citizens and um, can hope that that, that that will, you know, continue. Um, and then your last, you had, a, you had a final part to that. Appropriate response. Appropriate yeah. response is, yeah, yeah the organization, yeah. Yeah. you know, of local citizens and particularly parents um, to, to realize what is going on and, you know, to, to, to take a good hard look at whatever um, schools might be proposed for their area. Can I have one additional small comment? Oh, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. The Islamophobia thing also, I think, is, is really important to understand. And I thought, um, as you know, I'm, I'm in the area as, as well. Um, I see it as a um, device, as a rhetorical device to get people to be quiet and stop mm -hmm. criticizing us in order to allow the further advance. To, to sure. Sort of unlevel the playing field. So, sure. Yeah. I mean, when, when you realize that the term Islamophobia was actually coined by a front group of the Muslim Brotherhood, we call it the Triple IT, stands for International Institute of Islamic Thought, Triple IT. Uh, coined that phrase, you know, some time ago, decades ago. Uh, it came into more uh, wide usage more recently, and certainly uh, in, in most recent years um, has really caught on. But, but this is a brotherhood term exactly for what you said, to shut people up. When, when you are, um, you know, accused of something like that, you're supposed to say, oh, no, I don't want to be that. Oop. Okay, and then you stop. Well, the answer to that is, you know, not to stop. Okay, where was the next, uh, here. So we're here from Texas. Uh -huh. and, and live in Texas still. And my question was related, basically, once we help create this awareness, what, what is our recourse? How do we fight this? You know, once we create the awareness, what do we do now? Do we well, I mean, again, is it electing the right people? What, how, well, yeah, certainly it has, it has to do with your local elected officials. You know that they be aware of of um, the record of these schools and other other things um, elsewhere in the country, and then as parents, um, that if a new school is proposed or even an existing one is there, that they um, you know take the initiative to look at let's say the proposal for establishment of a new school, and as in Loudoun County, what they found in the proposal was just slipshod work where that particular proposal had taken other proposals from other places for other schools yeah. and just sort of copy pasted mm -hmm. into this one in enti an entirely inappropriate way. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and once they actually looked at the document, it was rather easy to see that it was uh, not a good proposal. So, you know, that's what parents can do and, and, and local citizens even who might not be parents. Who makes the eventual decision? Is it the legislature? It's, is it well, the board? yeah. Board. Zoning board and school board. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay, well, there's more than two. I want to get to, I'll, I'll stay, I don't mind. Seville. Um, yeah, we had some bills in the General Assembly this year mm -hmm. by Delegate Bob Rob Bell, and they think that this is the opening charter, charter schools, anybody can open one. Uh, in Virginia, be, you know, in light of all the issues we have with the public school system, there's many delegates right here in Virginia that feel that we need these charter schools. It all depends on so the charter school. If the bills passed, it didn't pass this year. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, a lot of us wrote letters, you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. trying to inform them. If they pass, though, next year, is, is this going to open up like nobody has to apply anymore? Oh, every school, school would have to apply. No, apply. each one it doesn't is an them, individual. Like, no, no, no. Each schools. one is an individual process, an individual proposal with everything that goes with it. I see. Okay. And each one offers a chance for the locals and the parents to and investigate. Why would they need the bills in the General Assembly? To have to see the wording of the bill, I, I guess. I, I'll have to go back and read it too. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. All right, uh, come over here. I will, I'm sorry. I will come back there, I promise. Do you think Abu Ghan will succeed by establishing his caliphate and become Sultan in the future after the ISIS? Yeah, um, Erdogan, of course, as, as, as we all know, um, it, it, you know, he, he has been more than accommodating 
um, to jihadist forces, in particular those that uh, are identified with the Islamic State. Uh, he has allowed jihadis to traverse through Turkish territory to cross the border into the former Syria. He has allowed some of those groups to actually uh, establish camps on Turkish territory. He has allowed them to come back on R&R, &R, if you will, or uh, to hospitals for medical care. Uh, he has allowed his intelligence services to uh, transport um, uh, chemicals in particular uh, that are nitrates and, and things like this that are useful for not much that I know of besides fertilizer and bombs. Um, some of that's been caught. Um, so he, he has been more than accommodating, I mean, I'm sure, as you know, uh, to um, uh, the forces of the Islamic State. And the reason, of course, is that he wants to overthrow uh, the Damascus regime of Bashar al-Assad, which is a satrap of the Tehran regime of the mullahs in Iran. Um, he um, has backed uh, numbers of other groups, not just the Islamic State, Ahrar al-Sham comes to mind and, and some others too. Uh, will he succeed in his neo-Ottoman ambitions? Probably not, simply because he's got a lot of competition. Um, you know, the Saudis are not going to give up what they see as their, you know, sort of premier role as keeper of the two holy places. They're not giving that up without a fight. Um, Iran has its own ambitions um, on the Shiite side of the ledger uh, to leading the Islamic world, um, ideologically speaking, in Sharia and Jihad. Um, so he doesn't have just a clear run at it. It's, it's, it's not just there for the taking. Whatever his ambitions may be, um, he, he's got a lot of competition in the neighborhood. That's what I would say. All right, please, come, come to you. Um, are Muslim candidates for citizenship in the United States required to renounce Sharia? No. Um, as far as I know, and I, I've been a vice consul abroad uh, on two different occasions, where I worked in um, non-immigrant visas, you know, like uh, visitor visas, student visas, uh, business visas. Uh, but for immigrant visas also, likewise, there is no such um, request that, that uh, anyone renounce uh, their ideological belief, whatever it may be. Um, it, it, least of all that, that Muslims- Sharia is not ideology, ideology it's law. It is law, it is, it, yes, it is a political legal system that, that um, really defines Islam. Islam is Sharia. Sharia is Islam. Um, but no, no one that I know of is, is, is obligated to renounce it or even questioned about it. They're not allowed even to question uh, incoming, whether for uh, non-immigrant or immigrant visas or in the refugee and uh, immigration, refugee resettlement and immigration process. On the table back there, you'll see two small monographs. One is by Ann Corcoran. Uh, which talks about the refugee resettlement program. That's the, sort of the orange cover book. Uh, the other one is called Red Green Access by Jim Simpson, and that gets more into the details of numbers and groups um, that sponsor and um, uh, help uh, to, to resettle refugees under contract to the Department of State. None of them is, is, is even permitted to think the kind of words and vocabulary we've used here tonight, much less to ask it of, of an incoming um, you know, someone who wants to come into the United States. But I, what I will say is that back in the day, on those um, non-immigrant visa forms, there used to be a question about your affiliation with or allegiance to communism. And likewise, that was a totalitarian uh, ideology, not a legal system in that sense, but certainly a totalitarian. And they had to answer that question. Now, could they lie? Yeah, of course they could lie. But of course, if it were to be found later that they had lied, it would be grounds for permanent um, exclusion from the United States. That's the point of that. Um, come back here and I'll come around. Okay, um, how does this success story make Sri Lanka the jihadist? What is the evidence? I'm sorry, say again? How does this success story make Sri Lanka a jihadist? Where is the evidence? Uh, on the, is, if you go person, to the Fatullah Gulen website. Is a person who has received his education in the United States uh, and who is inducted to the Western education system, I learned two important things. Bear to know, look for the evidence. Yes, so, and where I would point so you to, um, I would point you directly, I would point you directly to the website of Fatullah Gulen himself. I have it here on this slide. So the and I mean, in particular, I would encourage that you have a look at this essay. 
Um, I would tell you to take a look at this essay. Yes, this essay in particular is very revealing, I think, of, of Fatula Gulen's own thinking and ideology. Um, there are many other essays at his website. Thank you. Let her answer the question. I would just point you all to his own website uh, where he has many. There are, I don't know, dozens probably of his uh, essays and other uh, writings at his website. I recommend this one to you especially highly uh, because it's very revealing uh, of his, um, his, uh, his thoughts on, on jihad and Sharia, which he uh, addresses specifically in this essay. Thank you. Over here. Do you think that uh, Turkey will manage to remain in NATO with all this? That's a tough question. Um, you know, Turkey, uh, with its behavior at the moment, um, certainly cannot be considered a, a, uh, um, a fully, um, how do you put this, uh, you know, a, a, a full and, and uh, ally, ally in, in NATO. Um, certainly its activity in facilitating the travel of jihadis across its territory, et cetera, what I've talked about. Um, to the best of my knowledge, however, the question about Turkey's membership or even some sort of you know, graduated system of membership like you're on suspension or something uh, has not come up in NATO. To the best of my knowledge, there is no such consideration or, you know, any kind of rankings like, you know, you're, you're, you're suspended until your behavior changes. That, that, but, you know, at some point, um, they're going to have to address this. It depends on who the leadership is in the U.S. Yeah. Well, yeah, up in front here. I, I hope all of you have gone to a citizenship ceremony. They're very moving yeah. and, and touching, and you'll know uh, they don't ask you to renounce anything. They ask you to pledge yeah. your faith to the U.S. Mm -hmm. Constitution, mm -hmm. and this seems a positive message. You yeah. also indicated that a lot of these schools serving in poor, underserved mm -hmm. neighborhoods and so on produce good results, mm -hmm. et cetera. The FBI investigated four of them, you said, but found no evidence. Well, I didn't say they found no evidence. I said there's no invest there's no possible. prosecution yet. That implies that they didn't find the, the Well, I don't know that for a fact, not, actually. Yeah. What's bad about that? Well, why, the reason that I began this, this uh, presentation with Turkey uh, is to call to your attention what has happened to Turkey from the 20th century um, you know, under Kemal Ataturk and his modernization reforms um, to the current day when all of that is, is being chucked out the window um, and the Kemal uh, Ataturk's, um, you know, agenda is, is gone at the moment. It is reverted back to a time when Turkey was um, an Ottoman Empire, um, when it was a purely jihadist state. And I began that for a pur this presentation for a purpose with that because I do think that the influence of Gulen, his movement, his students, his schools, his entire you know, network of affiliates, uh, as well as other work you know, done by the political parties, let's say the AKP, um, has contributed uh, in, in great measure um, to the reversal of Turkey's modernization. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that is the concern of parents and, and others uh, who are looking at the influence, the spreading influence, the broad-based network of, of, of Gulen in this country. Uh, we don't want to happen to us what happened to Turkey, right, in short.